you are using are Maven and Jenkins. Um, so a brief overview of what we're going to be going over. Um, first, uh, the components that we use to build our product. Um, Jenkins, Maven, some Maven plugins we might talk about, um, and our token encryption utility so we don't have to store unencrypted passwords. Um, we'll go through the whole process from somebody commits something to it being deployed to our test environment. Um, how our overlay process works, and how our different environments from test to our QA environment to our production environment, and just the differences between those. So jumping right into it. Um, just a little background. We've had a, a very different system up to this point uh, at UW-Madison for building and deploying code that was relied on uh, cron, a whole bunch of Perl scripts, uh, something actually really green where we had some script that generated an XML document that then ran it through an XSLT transformation that generated an ant build script which was then run. Um, lots of CBS and tagging. It all worked. Um, but then the guy who wrote it and maintained it retired about six months ago realized that he didn't have to deal with it anymore. Um, and we're in the process, we're not completely on the system yet. Uh, but in the process of migrating to using uh, what we're going to present there. Uh, it is. It's just nice. It's a lot faster. It's a lot easier. And uh, it's a lot less fragile. Uh, so, components. Uh, the big one is Jenkins. Um, Jenkins is this wonderfully flexible continuous integration service. Uh, it can do a lot more than just building code. Um, but that's what it's really good at. What's helpful for us and for a lot of people in this room, hopefully, is that Jenkins natively understands Maven. So all these Maven projects we have, it uh, has a good concept of how they work in dealing with interdependencies. Jenkins actually deploys code to uh, our local Maven repository, um, and as well as deploying code out to our servers. We get notified of failed builds built by email and IM. So, like when I break something, I get a little instant message from Jenkins yelling at me for breaking it. Very motivating to not get yelled at by your automated tools. Uh, it has some neat integration with Jira. Uh, we actually track code migration through our issue tracker. Um, we have custom workflow in Jira set up. And <laughs> Jenkins can interact with Jira, move issues through Jira, and comment and on them and do all sorts of stuff. And a lot of this is through plugins, and it's really kind of crazy when you get playing with Jenkins. There's got to be like three or four hundred plugins available for the tool. And we've discovered, well, we'll kind of like, wonder if Jenkins can do that. And we'll look and like, oh yeah, there's three plugins for that. Which one works the best? So just a, what our Jenkins dashboard looks like. Um, one of the plugins we have installed is we like green instead of blue for things being successful. The default Jenkins, you'll get little blue circles for things being successful. Uh, but we've got a nice dashboard view of the state of all of our projects that things are all building and deploying correctly. The next part of this, and this is a pretty key piece, is a local Maven repository of some sort. Uh, Maven repositories can be as simple as just a web server and a file system you have SSH access to to deploy things. Um, but it's pretty easy to go to the folks from Sonatype and get their repository manager Nexus and install that. And it's a nice little utility that you can run on a server that you can deal with permissioning and all sorts of fun stuff. And it's a place where you can deploy your local projects. So we all have local development and things that we do. and it may not really be great fits for trying to figure out how to be, make it a true open source project because it's your local portlet that's doing something specific for it's your local fork of a portlet. So, um, we actually take uPortal and have a fork of uPortal and cut our own releases of uPortal and they end up in our local Maven repository. And so we can push snapshots and releases. We have our IDs, artifact IDs. It's our little world. 
The other thing that Nexus can do, uh, which is handy, not really related to the core process, but it can act as a proxy for the outside world of Maven, which is great for build stability. Um, you can set Maven up so that when you run your Maven commands on your machine or your server, instead of going to the central Maven repository, repo1.maven.org, um, it goes and talks to your local Nexus instance, which proxies all of the content. And yeah, it saves bandwidth, but we all work at universities. We have lots of bandwidth. The uh, bigger thing is it gives you build stability, because now you're not dependent on external repositories, right? As long as your local Nexus instance is up, a build that worked two months ago will work today because Nexus has all of the things that it need that your build needs cached. And that's great because as much as we want to pretend that you know those external services in the cloud are infallible, we don't want to be ever stuck in a situation where all oh, the central maven repository is done, we can't actually do any maintenance on our production server. Right? That that would not be a great place to be. The last bit is a, a custom tool we wrote. Uh, if you go to the Lanyard site, um, I should have said this at the beginning, the slides that we're doing right now are up on the Lanyard site, as well as a couple links to other things that are related. One of them is this token encryption service. And one of the problems we had that we were trying to solve, um, well, we've got this dirty little secret that our CBS repository right now is not a we have to be very careful with it because historically we just like committed passwords and stuff in the CBS. Right? That's great. Um, well, we still wanted a way to make sure we were able to version things. Right? We want to have that pie in the sky dream of if something breaks, I can roll back to it and all that fun stuff. Uh, but we really wanted to make sure that if somebody hacked into our subversion repository, which is um, I mean, it's, we have authorization stuff in place, but you can go to our the shared version repository that we have from any web client. There's no firewall or anything in front of it. We want to make sure that if that gets hacked, we're not in trouble because it has like all the SIS passwords and HRS passwords and all that stuff in it. Bad. Um, so we put together this little web app that uses uh, public key encryption to allow us to encrypt simple strings. And we've got a little self-service web app here. It's kind of hard to see on the right, but um, anyone on campus can use it. You can go and create a, oh, there we go. Anyone can come and create a service, which just shows up in this dropdown. And creating a service is creating a key pair. Um, you can go and select the service you want, enter your secret password, and click a button. And you get, you can't really see it here because it's a nice short box to hide all of the grossness, but it's this big encrypted string that we then put into some version or whatever. And that big encrypted string is only decryptable with the private key. In our world, that private key only lives on, in this case, this is for my QA. We've got three servers in my QA. There's a printed copy of the key in our security office. And then those three servers have a copy of it. And it's not backed up anywhere. The only place that private key exists is on those servers. So that's our, our, our approach for dealing with the security stuff. If you're interested in this tool, um, it is publicly available from UW-Madison's GitHub repository. There's a link on the Lanyard site. It's a really simple little web app that you can dump into Tomcat. Uh, there's Ant and Bash and Perl and Maven plugins for doing encryption and decryption on the command line as well. And that's what we use in the next step. So we talked about all these components. Um, one of the other things that Jenkins does is it has the ability to run slaves very easily in remote locations. And this is kind of key to our process. So we've got a, a main server that has the Jenkins master instance running on it. Um, and then we set up a slave. And, and set up is, is really easy. We essentially tell Jenkins, SSH to this machine, and it's now your slave. Jenkins does the rest of the work. It copies over some jar files and gets those up and running. And it's, it's really the 
barrier to entry of getting Jenkins set up is really, really small. Um, and each of these slaves can go and talk to our Maven repository. So this is kind of the infrastructure around our build and deploy process. So Tim's going to talk about commit to build deploy. All right. Thanks, Eric. Um, so really, how we use all these components is from the point of where the developer actually does a commit to our GitHub repository. Um, so this is an example of a Blackboard portlet that we're working on right now. Um, and I did a commit a while back, so it's a screenshot for that. So what really happens there is I typed git commit, git push. It pushes it to the GitHub repository. From that point, we have Jenkins set up to monitor that Git repository, monitor that specific branch that we're committing to. And so it goes and fetches the latest information from it at that point, does a maven clean and deploy. When you do that maven clean deploy, it pushes the code out to our Nexus repository for the latest snapshot. Um, so now you now that's just the base project too. Uh, with not really any configuration for dev test or production. It doesn't really know where it's going. It's just a generic work file. It can be used for any environment. Um, the next step would be for uh, another job in Jenkins uh, called the project test overlay um, to go through and see that there is a new snapshot out there. And then it's going to pull that down into that job and run a build for the test server. Um, and this is the overlay process that we'll talk a little bit more about in a, in a minute. Um, and Eric was talking about how you can do agents, um, agent instances of Jenkins. And this is one of the instances where you would use that. So that build actually doesn't run on the Jenkins server. It actually runs on the test server as an uh, agent. Um, this is really handy for um, having to decouple, having to build for specific environments. You could be running Linux versus Solaris versus Windows. Um, and it's really helpful for that, those kind of environments. Um, so after you do that initial build, you would then have a, it's kind of getting hard to see because it's so big, but um, that does uh, install onto the local Maven repository of the test server with the test configuration in that board. So that portlet is now built for test. Um, and what happens after that is you have to bundle that in with uPortal. Um, so it, there is a test uPortal that runs, test uPortal that runs again on the uh, agent on the test server, um, which would produce the uPortal war or here. Um, that would then be deployed to our Tomcat instance. And Jenkins does everything. And the only thing that the user had to do was hit commit. So it's, it automates a ton of stuff. Um, as you can see, it's pretty complex. But once you have this set up, it's so nice just to hit commit. And in about 15 minutes, your code's already out in your test environment. So it's really, really handy for that. Um, and here's another really good diagram that Eric put together. Uh, for just kind of that overflow of exactly what happens. Um, that's a little bit easier to read than the chicken scratch that I wrote. <laughs> um, does anybody have any like overall questions about that? When you say deploy, do you mean actually restart the server or just deploy to the server's favorite repository? I mean, what step? Uh, what the, at the very end, are you actually restarting Tomcat? Little your new war automatically? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, we have a, at the latest step, which I didn't really touch on, uh, we have a, in our dev and test environments, uh, we have a rolling restart that happens after a successful build, um, which will actually deploy it out to every instance. In the what uh, Maven plugin do you use to then decrypt that string and plug the passwords in when it builds a test server? Um, if you look on the uh, GitHub repository under that, we actually developed a uh, Maven plugin. I think it was a branch off of another plugin. No, it's um, yeah. So there's the, that token encryption project that's on GitHub. Um, there's a Maven plugin that plugs into Maven's already existing resource filtering. And so 
using the standard Maven resource filtering where you can do property placeholder type, type replacement. Um, we that code has a, a little hook that looks for properties that look like they're encrypted and then decrypts them using the private key on the server. So that's a that's a Maven plugin you wrote or it's a publicly available Maven plugin? It's a Maven plugin that we wrote, but it is publicly available. It's on GitHub. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that's one of the key things here. Uh, if we go back. Let's see. Here, a step around. So, the, the, the developer was doing local development on their project. And one of the things we always run into is where does this configuration go? And we really try to follow the same model we do in. Perio work where the portlets we're writing are generic portlets. They're not specific to an environment. The code that lives in GitHub for that project has no environment specific information in it. Um, it's set up for doing local development. So this commit and this build to Jenkins, where Jenkins is doing Maven clean deploy, just like I do on the command line if I wanted to deploy a new snapshot. Is all environment agnostic, and that's all that ends up in our. It's not really public, but our public Maven repository, where it becomes server specific is when the Jenkins slave or test in this case actually takes that new Maven artifact that was deployed and overlays the test configuration on top of it, doing the decryption and everything, and that artifact never leaves the test server. So that we've got some safety there around the only place that our credentials and configuration ever exists in a decrypted form is on the individual servers themselves. We don't have to worry about Maven artifacts getting pushed out somewhere that have passwords in them or anything like that. Do you use different sorry, do you use different passwords like now you're going to QA, then you're going to production and then does your plugin have some, how does it tell, hey, I'm building for the test server versus right. I'm building so for QA? When you encrypt it, you encrypt it with a key for that environment. Um, and so the private key, it lives on the test server. And the other part of that is we actually have, we'll get to the Maven overlay plugin in just a minute. We actually have overlays, environment specific configurations for each environment. Uh, this is the one thing about this that can get a little unwieldy. Um, so we've got five environments, pre-dev, dev, test, QA, and prod. And that means that for every portlet we deploy, we have five overlay projects, each with its own configuration. And so we kind of get this explosion of all of these little overlay config projects. Um, but it's totally They're not that working. big, though. If right. you think about it, it's just your config. So it's your property styles. It's like your logging information because you might want to have different logging for dev versus test. But they're pretty much the same files. So what we've been doing is we created dev1 from scratch. And then we just clone it to dev or test QA and then just change the encrypted tokens to that specific thing. So it's really not that bad stuff. It's just a little copy and paste, copy and paste. Yeah. So. Anybody else have any questions? So the configuration file is just like the encrypted uh, property files um, sitting on the server. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we'll get into a little bit more detail with that in a minute. We're actually, nobody said we weren't going to share screens, but. OK. Is there a hangout invite you can you're gonna send along? Yeah. Does anybody else have any questions when we get this set up? So your properties files get put into the WAR file. On the server that you're building on? Yes. Yep. So it's only decrypted at that point, and, but I'm assuming you have your servers pretty locked down. 
Yeah, well, I'm just trying to think of the pros and cons versus how we, you know, we, we have like a properties directory that's in the class path. And mm -hmm. So every WAR file can be dropped into any environment and it reads a Did you get the invite? In a conventional place. Right. But part of the danger in our system is we're not building on see. each environment. Eric so dot Dolquist. Version inconsistency. Mm -hmm. Let like me try again. Like, 32 and 34 might have a bug, and then suddenly the build doesn't work on one server. So I think we're vulnerable to that. Right. Yeah. How cumbersome is if you need to change the password? Where do you, do you do that in your, um, your web tool? Or yeah, you can, you can do it multiple ways. I mean, there's a command line interface that you can go in and just grab a new code. But it's really, that interface is really easy. Just jump in, select which. Uh, service you're doing this for, so your test environment, your QA environment, and then just type in the new password and then encrypt, and copy and paste it in here in config file. And then commit that config file to wherever you're storing it. That so, overlays that just kind of so you're like uh, the token in encryption, that small app, it's not actually writing you the so, uh, copy file right? directly. That's correct, right. no, it doesn't. Um, it just generates the does the WP encryption support multiple servers? Like in your yes, test environment? Yeah, that's what, the whole, that's what the service we'll see name was for. Um, so what we've done is for every environment we set up a service. It's basically a key encryption there. Um, so when you create a new service, which you can do on there too, um, it, you just type in what you want to name the service and how big you want the key link to be. Um, and then it will give you two links, one for the public key, one for the private key. Now the web app doesn't store the private key, it only stores the public key. So you really have to download that private key and put it in a secure location at that point. Um, so is that so you have to distribute that? Yeah, you have to distribute. Like what we do is we just put it on our test server in a specific place where the maiden the plugin well, I apologize for the people who are going to be online because then we're not getting the screen sharing working. But yeah. uh, I think afterwards we can maybe post a small skeleton of one of our environments that people can look at. Um, but this is an example of an overlay for one of this is the bookmarks portlet, the JSON bookmarks portlet. Um, and this is a fully fledged Maven project. There's a pom.xml in the root here. Um, and what it's doing is taking the bookmarks portlet artifact from JSON. We don't even have a local version of it. And just making some minor changes to it. Uh, in source main resources, we have beta source.properties. And this is what it looks like. Um, I had some white space down here so we can see. Setting up our JDBC connection information. And here's our big encrypted password. So if we need to change the password for that, for the test environment, which this overlay is for, I would just go to the token encryption service, encrypt the new password. Actually, what's even better with the token encryption service is when the DBA sends us a new password, we just tell them, go to this website, encrypt the password for my test, and then just email me the encrypted string. You don't have to like write it on a post-it note and come like hand it to me with a secret handshake or anything like that because you're just emailing me an encrypted string at this point. It doesn't matter if it's in my email box because if no one has the private key, it's just a big long string. So what happens during the build on the test server for this case is these couple files, the data source got properties, this application context, our logging config, get layered on top of the default bookmarks portlet or bundled back up, and that WAR file then just lives locally on that test server for later consumption and the actual deploying it to the server, deploying it to Tomcat. So we got kind of here. <laughs> but lots of tangents. There's lots of little things in this. So please, yeah. um, we don't necessarily have a ton of slides, but there's a lot of stuff to talk about. So questions are wonderful as we go through this. So basically, after going through that whole process, um, you deploy out. The last step is you have a new version of your portlet down there, and it was about 15 minutes from commit to 
deploy. And it's it was really handy because the way that our old build process worked in CVS is we had to rebuild every single portlet every time we built and then bundle it all into a U portal here and then push that whole thing out. Now we just have to build out one portlet, grab all the current builds of the other portlets, and then put them into an ear file and then push that out. It's, it's a lot better. Yeah, our our old, old build process, the turnaround time from developer committing something to getting it into the right environment was more in the hour-ish range and also required a lot more work and a couple steps from the developers. And this one is the commit and everything else is automated. Yeah. So this will probably look a little similar. I mean, it's a normal Maven uh, project setup if your source main, um, but your source main resources that's um, is kind of what the overlay process is, focuses on. Um, so you have your web app.properties, that's just like a generic web app.properties for say your dev environment that you commit to your local repository. When that build runs, it unpacks that war that you built for the project that's agnostic. Um, and then it applies the configuration for that specific environment. And this is really just a visualization of what we were going to talk about. But, um, and then it just repacks that war and cuts the new release and pushes that out there. So um, here's a really good overlay flow. I don't know if you want to yeah. add anything else. Um, that just kind of displays that. So this is what we have for each, each portlet in each environment. We've got this overlay project that references the Maven group ID, artifact ID, and version number for whatever we're, we're configuring. In this case, we're doing the demo portlet, the demo portlet overlay. And like Kim talked about, under source made resources, we have webapp.properties, which has web service URLs, passwords, all the other stuff you might need that's specific to a, to a environment. Um, and then the other part of this is our local Maven repository, where the Jenkins slave that's doing the building is going to pull this artifact that the overlay references plus this config and bundle it up into the overlay on the other side. Then the next step is the ear build flow where we take a bunch of these war files and package them up into an ear file that then gets pushed out to Tomcat. Uh, the amount of time it takes, like our you know 15 to 20 minute turnaround, um, one of the things that is actually takes 80% of that time is just restarting Tomcat. We don't just don't do hot deploys. Um, we've never had a lot of luck in server stability with doing hot deploys over time, um, and so that's most of the time spent in getting new code out there is just waiting for Tomcat to shut down and turn back on. Some other neat side effects of this process is these are all separate little Jenkins jobs. So when I commit code as a developer and Jenkins builds my environment agnostic code, that's one job. And then it's another job to do this overlay building. And then finally another job to put the gear together and deploy it. And because these are all separate, it makes the build process a lot more stable. Um, if this overlay process here blows up for some reason, another developer can still trigger this ear build flow for the other portlet overlay, and Jenkins is just going to use the last stable version of the demo portlet instead of whatever one is currently broken. And so that's great because one developer can't break something that then causes everyone to not be able to build. Chat about environment differences. Okay. So, I mean, like we kind of talked about with these overlays, it's really easy to configure differences between your dev and test and QA environment. Um, but we also set up in our Maven project, in the overlay projects, a little bit different configurations in the U portal instance um, just for usability. So, in our dev and test environments, we allow snapshot builds. This makes it a really quick turnaround time from committing something to our test environment because you don't have to do a release. Um, so snapshot or 
just so I'm pretty aware of. So snapshots are the latest build. It's kind of like the unstable nightly builds that you would see. Um, so it's the latest version. So you don't want to use that for your production environment. Um, all developers can commit to the, those overlay projects uh, for dev and test. And uh, the setup is really fast from commit build to deploy. Um, and after a successful build, uh, there will be a rolling restart for that, those environments as well. That's a little bit different than our QA in production. Uh, where we don't allow snapshots, so you can't have the latest version. So it, it's a more of a stable environment. Um, our QA environment is really specific for testers and client demos and that kind of thing. And then our production environment is obviously our whole user base. Um, and only admins can commit to the overlay projects. So that's kind of where we put in our uh, approval as the admin team. Um, we make or we review their what they're committing to make sure that it, it'll be okay and it won't completely break production, you know? And um, the other thing that that does, so we have a staging box in our QA and production environments, and then we have our actual um, cluster as well. So when you commit something, it will go out to the staging environment where you can test stuff. Um, but then the rolling restarts will only happen for QA, I think they happen nightly, and uh, for production weekly. So. Um, that's pretty much it for the environment differences, unless you had anything else to add. Yeah, just on the, the versioning, one of the cool things about this, so our, you know, I talked about our old process that we're very happy to getting away from Tim's lucking out and not having to deal with CVS too much at all. Um, <laughs> our old process was based around CVS and tagging files. And one of the things that was always a problem is some developer developers and do a whole bunch of work on one portlet and tag it all for test and then they tell us, okay, we need to move this into QA and here's the list of files that need to be tagged for QA course and CBS you tag on a per file basis. And we do that and it would break. And but it worked in test, but and we realized that oh we missed this one file or this other file. It was very hard to be sure you were actually moving the same code from test to QA to prod. Um, and with dealing with Maven artifacts, that is never a problem. So now we're at the point where if a development group wants us to move a new version of their portlet into QA, they just say, here's the new version number. Right? Like that's it. We get one number, we have to go change that one line. Realistically, that per environment config just doesn't change very often once you get it set up. And all of a sudden, we know that this is the same Maven artifact that was working in test that's getting pushed into QA, and then that same version number gets pushed into production. And we don't have to worry about, is this really the same code that was in dev and test in QA? Because that was always a nightmare, trying to make sure that we were in uh, a stable migration. And then going the other direction, it's really easy to go backwards, right? We push something out to QA and it breaks. You just go change the version number back to what it was, and we're back to that version. We don't ever lose the ability to go backwards in time. Uh, we can go look in our overlay version control environment and see historically what the state of any of our environments were at any given time. We could go into our production overlay and say what versions of all of the correlates were deployed three months ago and be able to go back and look at those, be able to go back into our Maven repository and actually see what that code was. In reality, do we have to do that very often? No, um, but it's nice to have the option there for quick rollbacks and kind of sanity checks and that sort of thing. So that's what we have for slides. Um, We can open up for any more questions. So you've got a um, local kind of public Maven repository yeah. where all of your generic uh, Maven builds go. Yeah. And then do you also have a local Maven repository in each of your servers, test, QA, dev, yeah. where those Maven builds get uh, 
compiled with your config changer. Right, so it's it's the local Maven repository that you get by running Maven. Right? Okay. You use Maven and you get that .m2 repository directory in your home. We just use that. Okay. Right. And so when that overlay build runs on the my test slave, uh, the Maven build is just doing a essentially a Maven install to stick that artifact in the local repository. All of the environment specific artifacts are resolved out of that local repository. So we don't ever we don't ever catalog archive those environment specific artifacts. We rely on the fact that we have the environment agnostic artifact in the main rate maven repository and we have all the configuration and version control which means we should, in theory, be able to reproduce any of those environment-specific artifacts at any time. Do you keep just a certain number of art artifacts on your server? So do you have a script that goes through? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, and I, I didn't think about it before this, but what Tim and I could do for the next couple days is work on getting a bunch of our scripts and kind of an example overlay env environment uh, made public. Um, but yes, we have a script that actually goes through the local servers, the test QA prod, and deletes all but the latest environment-specific versions of all of these local artifacts. Okay. The artifacts on our, the environment agnostic artifacts on our main Maven server, those are never deleted. We keep those forever. That's, you know, on a server with a connection to, you know, SAN storage, and we'll deal with, you know, a couple hundred gigs of storage there for the fact that we have historical artifacts and everything that's been deployed. But the local stuff, yeah, we we didn't at first, and then after we're doing this for about a month, we started getting pages that we were running out of disk space. Because when you build a new U portal in your file, like I don't know, in test a dozen times a day, and that's like four or five hundred megs each time, that it, it, it's a big test. <laughs> What's your disk space on your Maven, uh, your Nexus server? It's actually not that big. I think right now our, our Nexus server were, uses somewhere, I don't know, 20 or 25 gig, oh. even that. Okay. It's, because we don't, the, the biggest, what we experience the biggest artifact that we end up with is the year, but that's always environment specific. Okay. So all we really have in Maven is new war files for releases. We have Nexus set up that it only keeps the latest snapshot around. So if you publish snapshots over and over and over again, it only ever has the, the latest one. Oh. Um, and releases. So you're talking for a big Portland project, 20 or 30 megs for each war file, and people aren't releasing them every day. So it's, it doesn't add up that fast. Okay. How do you deal with unit testing properly? For example, uh, in our environments, the, the data is different, so the test against live databases need to have different parameters. Right, so for unit testing, um, Jenkins actually runs unit tests as part of the thing made it. Um, and it actually has a really nice interface for um, showing the results of those unit tests. What we try to do with our unit tests is try to have like a base unit test, which will just do base unit test with mock objects, and so it doesn't actually integrate with anything. We also have integration tests if we want to run something for a specific environment. Um, but usually we probably run integration tests. Okay, and that's, that's key. So we've got kind of two different points in this build process where we build a project. Um, this is the one where unit tests would get run, where a developer commit something to the project and Jenkins actually goes and runs a Maven clean deploy on it. And that's where our unit tests run. But we, we very much try to follow that separation of unit tests are unit tests. They should be able to be run anywhere, anytime, by anyone on any machine, and they shall pass. And that integration tests are a separate thing which we run manually. Um, the other part of this, the overlay build, there's no unit tests that happen because they're not actually compiling code. The overlay project doesn't have any tests in it or anything like that. Um, so we aren't doing tests at that point. Yeah. Thank you. 
you could. It, it would kind of be gross to get set up, but you, you could. Um, yeah, we don't we don't have it, so we don't have a great answer for that. If you're trying to do the environment specific testing via kind of JUnit or something like that, um, that's something that we don't really have in our process right now. Um, I don't doubt you couldn't figure out where to fit it into the process, uh, which is not something we had worked or designed around. So I have, say I have a couple of servers, I have a Nexus server set up, I got a, another VM for, for Jenkins. What do you think would be the time frame to bring um, test QA and prod servers spun up with this process? About a week or two? Uh, well, the one caveat, are all of your projects already using Maven? Yeah. Okay. The ones I care about. Because <laughs> this, is, this is our problem is we've still got like 25 projects in CVS that are using AMP that we have to convert to this process. Uh, okay. So that takes yeah, time. Yeah. Um, if we can get the kind of the framework for this published, I, I guess a week or two we get it set up. Okay. Um, getting Jenkins set up is really, it, it's really easy. Um, Jenkins it has a, a standalone runtime version um, or a WAR file you can drop into your favorite server container. Um, it stores all of its config just on the file system. Uh, upgrading Jenkins is, I'm probably going to do that later for us for us this morning because they've released a couple new versions. They, they release a new version every week. It's kind of interesting. But upgrading is as simple as you just drop the new Jenkins war file in Tomcat and it upgrades itself. Nice. It's very easy. It's very lightweight. By developers for it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> for developers, yeah. Uh, yeah, so I, I'd say a week or two. Um, okay. Make sure to bug Tim and I, and we'll, we'll get a skeleton of this pushed out and made public along with a bunch of our scripts so that people yeah. can play with it. We're, you can't tell we're very much sold on this. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's been a wonderful transition for us. Uh, and and it's, we've gotten a lot of good feedback. We've got a kind of a decentralized development environment where we're on the portal infrastructure team that manages the portal itself and the servers and everything like that. And then we have a couple other groups of developers that do portal development. And it's great for them because it decouples our build and deploy process from their development process. Uh, the old system, everyone had to use CVS because that was the only way to get code into the portal. We're now at the point where we don't care what they're using. Um, in this workflow here, we don't care. We don't actually really care where their code is. All we care is that the end result is Maven artifacts in our Maven repository. They can deal with that how they want. And, and that's a really nice decoupling there and giving the developers some more control over their projects. Are you running a separate VM for each Jenkins slave, or are you running multiple instances on a, on we actually, a single VM? So the slave uh, for us is actually one of our test servers. Um, that way that it's built on a machine that's running it. Um, and it's really, like you said, it's really easy to set up. It's you know, SSH and, and give it a user, and it dumps anything that it needs. Yeah, so we. That is part of the security side of it is Jenkins is actually building the environment specific code on the actual environment machine. Um, and that's where we have the concept of it's not as big of a deal in dev and test, but in QA and production, we have the concept of a staging machine versus a runtime machine. So, like in production, we actually have five, um, we're on physical hardware still, uh, but we have five physical machines. Four of them are always in the um, virtual IP, the, the, the L4. Um, one of them is the one that Jenkins is using as a slave is our staging machine. It's never in the L4. It's a place that we can deploy new code and go and test it actually in production to make sure that all the integrations are correct before deploying it out to the other machines. Okay. And one more question in that. Yeah, you can <laughs> make sure no one further back. Um, 
how do you guys do like your database stuff where you have like persistence and that? Do you like in your dev and test do like an in-memory database where you just load some data and like it's basically disposable? And then you do QA do like an Oracle from that kind of background. How do you guys deal with that? Does that make sense on that side? Well, in the yeah, in the uh, in the overlays like he showed an example of, um, we have our URL to which database that we're using and what dialect we're using. So you could have it be different if you really wanted it. Be if you want to make SQL in data and test and then Oracle and production. I mean, you could do that if you want to. And do you just, do you just load your data like by hand? Is that like logistically to actually get it there before you start testing? Or do you guys have like a replicated process? That that's, that's very much up to each portlet developer and whatever data they have to integrate with. Um, we don't necessarily have we, we don't really have any portlets or applications where we have to do kind of repeated data loads. Um, they're integrating with like our, our student information system actually has dev test QA and prod environments. And so all of the portlets that integrate with that system just integrate with the corresponding SIS environment. The portal itself, we don't, we don't like reload the dev and test environments regularly. They're just there, um, and that's how uh, the the data. It, there's not there's not necessarily that need. Although, are you asking about like the U portal like importing portal definitions and stuff? Well, no. It's like, for instance, you might say like some like a notification where normally like in dev. Test you would necessarily have notifications or maybe a prod just where you know where you'd actually have something that's kind of like that would kind of add controls where the data is actually at. Yeah, and that's that's very much up to the developer that needs the data, how they get it yeah. into that environment, we, whatever data store for that environment. We do have a Jenkins build that deploys out uh, like our entity files, which consist of uh, portlet definitions and everything like that per environment. Um, so that's we maintain all those in our SVN repository. Yeah, we're uh, a couple minutes over, over, but we're more than happy to keep chatting and answer questions. Uh, like I said, the slides are all up on uh, Lanyard, and I will post, or we will post uh, more information with like a skeleton overlay project and some of our scripts uh, the next day or two, and they'll all be linked from the Lanyard site. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.